on Zoom. All right, this, this meeting is being recorded. And uh, tonight, again, I'm, I'm kind of glad I was prepared. I'm Rebecca Kimmons, and I'm here in Martinsburg, six hours away from my hometown, Charleston, because I care very deeply. I'm also, uh, I want, hmm, okay. <laughs> How come it's not working? I want to hit, got it. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm here tonight because I care deeply. And I'm going to introduce my uh, my partner here, my cohort, uh, in just a moment. He's going to walk up here. Mr. Dan Page. I'm with affiliated with an organization called Create West Virginia that has been dedicated since 2007 to bringing a conversation to the state of West Virginia about innovation and entrepreneurship. That's what we're all about. Uh, people used to think that Create West Virginia was um, arts people. Well, arts is certainly a part of innovation and invention and entrepreneurship. Uh, often entrepreneurs are the artists of the business world. Uh, they're the ones who are out thinking outside the box. They're the ones that are creating. And we, our stance back in 2007 and continues to be that uh, innovators are job creators. And instead of asking the people who have already created something, let's uh, involve the talented young people of West Virginia. Let's tell them that they can innovate, they can create and they can create jobs for us and uh, for themselves here in West Virginia. We don't need, uh, well, we need all hands on deck at this point, but um, we need to be instilling a sense of entrepreneurship in our own people. So I'm gonna ask Dan Page to come up here. Dan has never really been involved with Create West Virginia. Um, he has a, an interesting background. He and I both graduated from the School of Journalism at WVU in 1971. And Dan has had a very interesting career. He's a journalist. Uh, he has been the editor in chief of the State Journal twice. And um, he was a Democrat. Uh, we're not political here tonight, but I think it's important to uh, say that uh, Mr. Page was a Democrat in Cecil Underwood's administration as press secretary. So that's, uh, I think, an important thing to understand that uh, we're not political. We've dropped political stuff here when we came in the door. But what we are tonight is inventors and thinkers and innovators. And um, this was billed as visioning session. Um, what we found in Charleston is that people were so full of emotion they really couldn't talk about visions yet. So what we wanna say is this is the beginning of many sessions that we intend to conduct around the state to open uh, minds and give permission for people to think boldly, think innovatively. So Dan Page, will you come up and, and do a better job of introducing yourself? Um, thank you very much, Becky. I'm here because I wanna be a better alumnus at WVU. Um, I, I very much appreciated my time there, and it's it's kind of an emotional topic, frankly, for many, many people in West Virginia, including me. Um, my first exposure to the campus there was in 1958 at a football game, and it's something I never forgot, and it was very important for me to be on a college campus, and then I had a chance to go to school there, and I really enjoyed my time at uh, WVU, uh, and it was a place to start what ended up being a very interesting career and a very rewarding career. I enjoyed the time of my time up there and, and throughout my news business side of my life, I recognize that West Virginia University is dear to many people in this state. And I am very, very interested in what the future will hold. At, my, at this point in my life, I, I recognize that I should have been active, much more active earlier. But my goal now is to be a better, as I said a moment ago, a better alumnus and, and start becoming more aware of what the, the university is doing and what its plans are. And as Becky said, I am, I'm not, I, I actually helped, I started, I did the coverage of 
Create West Virginia back in its early or early days at, at the State Journal. And I, I like I like the idea. Business newspaper. And we, there's a connection with the, what the Create West Virginia folks are doing and what the future of West Virginia looks like. And you know, my hope is to start coalescing alumni, friends of the university, getting them together to consider what the university should look like next year, decade, because we have found out over the past few years that technology has changed the game for the newspaper business. It's changed it for many of the We don't even go to the dry goods. We need to get online. So the technology world is also changing education, so it may provide us more opportunities. So what I, I want to do is call, bring people together who are interested in it and, and create West Virginia would be the, the vehicle to do that. Have information, form information to present to the university as it considers its future. There is an acute situation going on right now, and I have no idea what's going to happen. That's sort of a Rubik's Cube of problem in as much as University's got a, a real we're not, we don't want to be the staff of board of governors. We want to be teaching beyond beyond what they're recognizing that everybody's not happy. Obviously, you know that you heard that Tuesday evening with Charleston. That's my dream. I've opened up a channel of communication on the more of a grassroots group. It sounds very, I'm a pretty not so touchy, uh, and this sounds a little touchy feely for me, but we have to start something. It's worth it. It's worth a try. I care about it. I'm not the world's greatest alumna, alumnus. I want to be better, and I intend to, to do so by contributing to this effort and hoping to open up some lines of communication with WVU in the future. So that uh, it looks like you're up. If you would, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I wish you would because okay. Um, we have a situation here tonight, uh, much like our situation in Wheeling, and I might be disheartened by a room where you know that could accommodate as many as forty people. Uh, is not accommodating that many people tonight. But I got a, a call today from um, a really interesting gentleman who is an expert in adaptive leadership. And he was telling me adaptive leadership is a theory that leaders emerge, that leaders are not named by authorities. Uh, leaders emerge in situations where leadership is needed. And that's certainly the case here in West Virginia. And he said that there was a woman um, at an Indian tribe who wanted to make a change in alcoholism and on the reservation. And she called a meeting and she had 12 chairs set in a circle and no one came. The following week, she had this call again, 12 chairs, nobody came. She did this for two years. Then they finally figured out that she was not going to give up. She cracked it and they began to make some difference. They began, that's what leadership is. You don't give up. We're not gonna give up. Somebody online wanna say something? Pardon me? I think the folks online wanna say something. Okay, so we'll open it. We have two guests here and uh, they come from the community of Shepherdstown and uh, our, our lady here is, is fairly shy and she will not speak, she says. But I know that she's uh, important to the arts community in Shepherdstown. And she was talking earlier about how important the arts are uh, to her community. And I was agreeing with her that uh, we absolutely need cultivation of the senses, which is what the arts are. So Corey, I'm gonna let you begin moderating for the people who are on the Zoom. So let's hear what they have to say. Yeah, so um, Mindy, I see you're here. Um, would you like to 
share, um, you know, what brings you here today and kind of some of your thoughts and feelings on situation, vision for the future? Sure. Um, hi, thank you for and if, having me. And if me. you would, if you would, no, no need if you, yeah. Please well, show your... I just look a mess. Thank you. <laughs> Pardon me. Love um, I'm I'm here because uh, I support um, our our you know flagship school, and um, it's disturbing to kind of hear what's happening. And um, so I want to show my support, um, get ideas from those in the thick of it. You know how we can best support them as a community, and. Um, you know, and what the vision is and, you know, what we can do to help. Um, I'm in Morgantown, um, so I'm hoping to come in person to the meeting that um, you guys will be having there uh, to meet to meet you in person. But um, I just wanted to get an idea, you know, how people were feeling and um, and what they needed. I'm glad you're here, Mindy. Um... Yes. All right. This is wonderful. Go for it. Oh, you're on. I was finished. <laughs> I was finished. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity. All right. Thank you, Mindy. Um, and if you have, you know, if you have other thoughts, um, you know, feel free to, uh, you can raise, press the raise hand button. We can bring you back. It occurs to, to me that, that I haven't. That, that, sorry. Yeah, I haven't introduced Corey Zinn. Corey Zinn is the gentleman there in the middle. Uh, he we handed the reins of Create West Virginia over to him a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago. Uh, Corey's a fairly recent. Well, let's see, 2014 graduate of WVU, and I'd love for you to tell us more, uh, Corey, about your experience at WVU. And when I met him, he was, I think, maybe a couple of years out uh, of WVU and doing everything. He was our poster boy for Create West Virginia because, well, you tell us, Corey, about what you did at WVU and what you've done since. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Corey Zinn. I'm the board president and executive director of Create West Virginia. Um, Make yourself big on the screen, please. Uh, thought I did. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I graduated in 2014, almost 10 years ago. Kind of amazing uh, how time flies, but because I still feel like I'm figuring things out. Um, but I went to WVU. Um, you know, I had a lot of ideas with what I wanted to do there at the time. I was, you know, really interested in music and uh, creativity. Um, I wanted to really wanted to start a music label is kind of the dream. And so I ended up at the business school uh, thinking I wanted to do management, but realized that marketing was sort of the place I should be. And I also um, entered the music technology uh, minor program before it even really started, because um, they were telling me, oh, this will be a minor um, you know, maybe by the time you graduate, but you can go ahead and start taking the classes and we'll see what happens. Um, so I really was able to run with that at the Creative Arts College at WVU. Um, and, you know, I actually, everyone's always asking about the major, but I want people to ask about my minor because that's where I really had fun. And I, I did feel like, um, you know, I kind of talked yesterday at, on the wheeling call about this, but for those of you who aren't there, I I really wanted to, I changed my major a couple times from, you know, I came in trying to get a uh, liberal arts degree. And when I actually was showed up, they said, oh, that degree doesn't exist anymore. So you're in general studies and you're stuck there for six months. And I learned that that was not really the place for me because I did have ideas where I wanted to go. And they were kind of like trying to prep me and figure it out. And really, I just wanted full reins to take all the classes I wanted. But you kind of have to pick your major, switch around. It was a lot of work. I, I switched to a, a multidisciplinary studies degree for a little bit, which I was later discouraged from saying, you know, kind of that's not a real degree kind of thing, um, which I 
I would, you know, I have lots of thoughts about that now, but, um, but so I, you know, I wanted to take art classes, drawing, I took for a little bit before I pulled out of the, the multidisciplinary studies. Um, and when I was in the mark, when I was in, you know, B and E, um, I also was surprised at how little I was able to work with the, what became the Reed College of Media to take some of their classes that felt very relevant for somebody who wanted to be in creative and marketing. Um, I was learning all about the strategy side of things, um, but I couldn't take classes on video production and graphic design and most of the things that I, that I do today that I kind of had to just self-learn. And, um, you know, I, I really loved some of the independent studies I did where, and teachers that would kind of give me more free reign to, we, we had this one independent study that we competed in this national collegiate program uh, contest, um, building a marketing plan for this Tzatziki's Mediterranean fast casual dining franchise. And we actually, we went all the way to the headquarters in Birmingham to present with a, against five others. And we actually won it um, to the surprise of the judges exactly within all these points to tie with another winner in, in Arkansas, um, Little Rock. Um, but uh, it was a, it was amazing because it was everything I wanted um, in that we were working with people at the College Read of Media uh, or the Read College of Media to work with their video production people to make this video ad. Uh, we were working with the music school to write a score for the video and radio ad. I was, I used some resources at the radio station and some of the, you know, got voiceovers from the staff there. Um, and it was really just a, like, a, you know, the whole community coming together and collaborating. And it, it was, it was really cool. Um, I tried to get some of the kind of faculty excited about that. I think everyone's kind of just in the sort of day to day and it, it kind of just got missed, but I really always wanted to celebrate that. And now in the, re in the, you know, in the workforce and kind of real world outside of university, I've been really inspired by what I hear about what's going on. The community colleges, a lot of collaborations like where, Hey, the, you know, the culinary school is working with the business school to help or, you know, business department to kind of do collaborative projects and kind of be that piece. And it's just like this whole, you know, community you see, growing and collaborating right in there. And I didn't exactly get that at WVU, even though there's so many resources and it's just this giant institution. So it's really, I don't know what that says about, you know, um, about kind of, I don't, I don't really, I don't, it, I don't really know what to say about it, but I, I just, I, have I always something wish, I would venture sure. to say. I would venture to say that you were ahead of the curve that you were there, you know, ready in, as a person of your generation to do the things that you needed, you were ahead of the curve. You were ahead of the faculty um, and you were certainly ahead of the administration because if the administration, and, and here's, I'll couch it in the form of a suggestion that perhaps uh, they might have been looking at what was going on nationally, the demographic shifts that were predicted long ago. The futurists were talking about this. And maybe instead of building lots of new buildings, they would have been thinking about building um, lots of fiber connections and creating lots of collaboration with other schools in the state since they are the flagship university, which implies that they're the first ship with many ships coming after them, which would be the smaller schools. Uh, maybe collaborative instead of uh, com competitive. So um, I think that Corey Zinn, they should have been looking at you, uh, as I have, for a model of what the university needs to be, which is break down the silos between all these colleges and make it truly multidisciplinary. So, you know, these are the kinds of ideas that we want to present to the Board of Governors and they can't ever say, uh, well, no one, no one thought of that, that's not a good idea. Well, you know, maybe it is a good idea, maybe it is something to consider. So, um, 
Didn't you want to speak? No, our, I, I would like, this is a very informal session, and what we would like to do is have each who is willing to speak, to come up and be recorded here. You have to come up here and talk across the microphone of my computer in order to get um, recorded. So we would, obviously, if you've taken the energy to come here tonight, you have something to say. Ta-da! Maybe after I've heard a little bit more, I just got here. Yes, you did. Well, but here's what I tried to say in that uh, in that release is we don't have a lot of information. We don't have facts and figures. But I will tell you, I would like to direct you to the createwv.org website. There's a button there where they've been compiling as much information as they can find. They are compiling. You can see as many articles as we can find that have been written, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, um, uh, Washington Post, the New York Times, those articles are all compiled at the createwv.org site. Also, letters, a really important letter from the, um, the very famous and, and popular language app. Uh, there's a person who's written there and says, she, she wrote to the Board of Governors or to the president of the university and said, this app that I am uh, a leader at is not sufficient, you know, for uh, it doesn't take the place of a university education in linguistics or language. And it's very articulate. It's very important. Um, you can read that letter on this compilation at createwv.org. Um, a lot of smart people have do have facts, and those facts have been compiled, and they are available. Sometimes they've got a bias. Uh, an educated person should be able to uh, target bias, understand bias, be able to identify it, and draw their own conclusions. Um, so we are thankful to WVU that we are educated people and we can think critically thanks to the education that we got there. So uh, could, could you recap for me since I was late what the gentleman who was on the screen when I came in, what he had said, because I missed most of it, I think. That's Corey Zinn. And he was talking uh, as a WVU alum um, about his experience at WVU, which he took the bull by the horns, perhaps I'm overstating it, Corey, but, um, and created his own program, the program that he wanted. And he did it, I don't know how painful it was, I think you managed to cobble together what you needed uh, with some effort. So I'll let you explain further. John, it's great to have you here and I appreciate your being here very much. So we, John well, Doyle. I'm glad to be here, and I, yeah, I just want to listen a little bit more. John Doyle uh, came in to join us, and I've known jo John for, gosh, I bet you, a long, long time, long time. Long, long time. And uh, I'm so happy to see you here. I know that you have ideas, and I know you have opinions. Yeah. So Corey, talk about WVU of your experience again, if you don't mind, encapsulating. Sure. I don't know if there was a another. I didn't really hear the question, if there was one from the audience or John. It's very hard to, um, unless you're standing here talking over the mic, then they can't it, hear. It was answered. John is being shy for some reason. I can't uh, imagine well, that. He's He came to hear. He came to listen. So um, he's so far refusing to come up and be recorded. Okay. Is was there a question though, or just um, the question was that wanting he to wanted hear more. you yeah. to um, encapsulate what you had said? He came in late while you were talking, and he was interested in what you were saying. Okay. Uh, yeah, I I was kind of talking about, um, and I and I don't know. It's hard to say how relevant it is. I mean, I, I think it's very relevant for the what the future of kind of schools and um you know learning centers of any kind should be uh i don't know you know how it feels hard to i i think in times of scarcity where we're talking about you know 45 million dollar cuts it's a little bit 
like, whoa, we're in, you know, fire extinguishing mode. Um, it's hard to think innovationally and sort of, well, what's next? What's the future? Um, how do we sort of create new good programming with less money? I remember having a conversation with, um, I forget that it was a, it was a, like a teacher's, I think it was like a event full, um, for school boards and, and faculty. Uh, and it was in a very hectic time. I remember speaking on innovation and, and essentially on, you know, this is your, your students probably know more than a lot of the teachers do about a lot of the things, you know, that they're, um, you know, a lot of the schools, for instance, have access to raspberry pies, something that create West Virginia has dabbled in a lot and kind of educated on a, a educational coding computer. That's very cheap and accessible. Um, good for teaching coding, especially to, you know, to younger audiences. And some of these things, you know, there's so much free information available on YouTube. And I, I think it's it's kind of clear, I think, to young to younger people that, you know, we haven't, there's this kind of gap that we haven't moved past where they're kind of driving a little more or that, you know, we're still kind of stuck in a lot of old thinking or learn it, read reteaching the same information that, that we were learning 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and meanwhile, you hop on YouTube and you're like, wow, here, okay, here's how I do what I want to do. Um, so, so who needs uh, school is the question. That so is the question. I think, I mean, that has been the question and that's, that's why I think that's a big reason why, you know, the university has a drop in enrollment. We have COVID, which kind of pushed, over the cliff of like, oh, is college, you know, is university necessary? Can we just do boot, uh, code camps or, you know, just sort of, as long as you can kind of get some experience, uh, get in the door, then that's, that's really what you need uh, to learn. I felt myself like I had to relearn everything once I actually started, you know, got a job or started, you know, working my own business. Um, I, I, I don't know that the universities are, it feels like there's so much just fat to it and that there's a lot of, uh, I, again, look to the community colleges um, and just kind of impress what they do with such a lean, with, with lean resources. And I think, well, surely the universities could stretch what they're working with more, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of conversations about the budget and how that could be managed. But I, I, I really am excited about these conversations because I like the idea of rethinking universities right now. This is kind of, this feels like the the time if it wasn't already, um, if, there, if it wasn't already the time, you know, pre COVID or something, we definitely need to be thinking about what the future of universities are. And um, if we, if it doesn't seem like we need a degree, then what do, what do people need to thrive? Um, and, um, you know, attach a institutional business model to that. Um, I love too what's, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not really talking about what I was before, but I also, I think it's the College of Charleston in South Carolina has a really cool model, the business school working with communities uh, where they, you know, similar to what Create West Virginia did with the internship program um, where, you know, they would essentially business school students would work with real businesses and apply what they were learning today to a business that could be, you know, 10, 50 years old uh, in that community. And so you're just kind of directly plugging in, building trust with, uh, with, you know, younger people, which I think is really important because I, I still even I'm 31 now. Um, and it maybe only just feels like anyone started is really like taking me seriously. Um, besides just little, just individuals, um, it really is tough as a young person in West Virginia, um, and feels like it takes a long time to be recognized that, oh, your voice matters and you actually have learned something and have something to offer to the community and your input, you know, could make a difference. I see, I I've seen, you know, 12 year olds that I'm like, holy crap, how are you doing more than, you know, I would love to be where you're at. Um, I'm glad you said that, Betty. Yeah, not just young people. I do. I I I kind of see this. I mean, I see the same thing with uh, Rebecca, for instance. I you know I feel like 
um, you're still kind of ringing that bell, like, hello, innovation. Um, so it, it does feel like a never ending battle um, to kind of go against the grain and think innovationally and say, hey, can you slow down a second and not do what we've always been doing? We can tell something needs changed. Um, but it's always easier said than done, but I'm glad we're here talking about it. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to hear what other people just have to say. I would love to hear from anyone who hasn't spoken uh, in the- Betty, uh, Betty's got a question. Oh. Betty, what um, what's your question? Or uh, hi, thank you. I'm, I'm I'm becoming a groupie. You know, this is the third um, session. I plan one in person in Charleston, and I'm going to try to go to Morgantown virtually. I'm thrilled, Betty, that you've been steady with us all the way and from the very beginning of Create West Virginia. Well, I think I I really like what you're doing, and I think it's a good base to do that from. Um, so, and and I, just uh, for the record, what I've said before that I have two master's degrees from WVU and my father taught there for 14 years and uh, my sister and my younger son both have bachelor's degrees. Uh, and, and by the way, my younger son's bachelor's degree in 2008 was in multidisciplinary studies and it worked out really well for him and now he's a national journalist, so. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that program, um, and one of the things I've been thinking about is since yesterday is that um, we don't all know what we want to do right out the gate, and and I know I the reason I have two master's degrees is because I thought I wanted to teach, and after I taught a year, I realized I was too shy to be in the classroom, and and became a social worker, and and it worked out really well. But since John Doyle is there. And, and John is a brilliant strategist. Um, John, I wonder if you would take a question from me and, 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 and share a public response. Okay. <laughs> He's coming. Yeah. Hi, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. Hi. All right. uh, I'm John Doyle, uh, and I used to be in the legislature. I was in for 26 years, uh, finished up uh, last year. And I served on, uh, on the uh, Finance Committee for 19 years and was chair of the Higher Education Subcommittee on that committee. And then the last four years I was in, I was a member of the Education Committee. And I have focused on higher education since I first got elected in 1982. And the reason is... For 10 years prior to that, I sold college textbooks for a living. And I would interact with salespeople from my own company. I was eight years with John Wiley and Sons and two years with Houghton Mifflin. I would interact uh, with people, uh, other book reps from my company and from other companies. And you'd start talking about institutions of higher learning around the country. And three or four people would say, what kind of school is that? They'd say, and immediately you've been thinking, okay, what schools in my territory are like that school where they sold this book we have, so maybe I can sell it there. So, so I, got I got to the point, point where I knew just a little, little a tiny, tiny bit of information, information about every college or university in the country. Uh, and that was a long time ago, but I have focused on it since then. So uh, first of all, uh, I agree with the, with the first speaker that we need to look at new models. We need to have some fresh thinking. Absolutely. At the same time, we shouldn't automatically throw everything out that we've had before. Uh, it's got to be a blend because there are some things that we've been doing that had we done them right would have worked. Uh, the, I also like the fact that WVU in recent years has stopped calling itself the land grant university and has started calling itself the flagship university. Uh, and two reasons I'm glad about that. First of all, uh, the only big deal about a land grant, it means is you have an ag school. That's it. The, the um, moral, uh, the first moral act of 1862 uh, gave grant of land out west to every state to establish an agriculture school. Uh, about half of the states did it 
at schools that were their flagship universities. Uh, we did that, uh, Maryland, Ohio, Penn State. About the, the other half uh, created a separate institution. For example, in Virginia, UVA is the flagship, Virginia Tech is the 1862 land grant. Same way with UNC Chapel Hill and North Carolina State. You can go all over the country and you can tell which ones are which. Now, the other reason I didn't like it is they are, WVU is not the land grant institution. We have two land grant institutions. There are 18 states that have a second 1890 land grant institution because of segregated higher education. Uh, and that was what's called the Second Morrill Act, and West Virginia State University holds that land grant. So I'd just like to be clear about things. I do think one of the things we've missed out on, but, well, next, West Virginia has seriously cut funding for higher education in general. It's not just WVU that's having problems. Shepherd, my alma mater, uh, has to make up $3 million this year and $3 million next year. Uh, all states have cut higher education public funding, almost all. Very few have cut it as deeply as West Virginia has. And at the very least, I think we have to make that up. And in particular, uh, a couple of years ago, the legislature established a funding formula for higher education, which is, I think, much fairer than the non-formula that had been on the books for years and years and years. Now. In order for it to work, though, we need to put some real money into that formula, or it'll, only, it'll end up just being a fairer way to underfund every institution. So that's just, just not going to work. Um, another thing we've missed out on, and uh, Becky, you uh, 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 started off with the definition of a, of a flagship institution. Uh, it's, it's more than just first in line. It is a, a state flagship institution, a public flagship, is the, the, uh, is the institution that A, awards the highest number of doctoral degrees of any of the institutions, and B, is the principal research institution. And so WVU qualifies there. Now, most other states have, in the last 40 years, also made their flagship universities more selective admission uh, than the other institutions. I think we've missed the boat there because WVU, if you compare the, the 24 1862 land grant institution that are state flagships, compare those 24, WVU is next to last. Well, in, in the U.S. News rankings for undergraduate education now I'm talking about. And only the University of Alaska is behind WVU. WVU is behind schools like LSU, University of Maine, University of Kentucky. We can do better than that. And they, I'm, 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 I'm almost done, sir. <laughs> um, we can do better than that, I think. And if we do, we will have a school that will act as a beacon to high-performing high school graduates that will then want to stay in state and, and go there. That's what most of the these other states, states found, found out. out. Initially, and in almost all of them, them there were rejections will lose students. Plain truth is they ended up gaining students because they kept the higher-performing students in state. And if you keep the higher-performing high school students in state, much better chance you'll keep them here after graduation. And if somebody wants to argue, well, we, higher education should be open to everybody, we've got eight other institutions which would remain open admission. So we're not shutting anybody out. So, yes, sir. I, I was just going to ask you, uh, what, uh, in what way are we trailing those uh, 23, 22 other schools? Thank you. If you yes. Repeat the uh, question so that it yeah, the question is, in what way are we trailing these other schools in the U.S. news rankings? And it is our very poor, the WVU's very poor retention rates and graduation rates impaired, not, compared to schools like University of Kentucky, LSU, and the University of Maine. And I picked those three because they are a combination flagship 1862 land grants. And those are all small states 
with poor economies, just like us. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, <laughs> Betty, <laughs> is there anything I left out? Because I'm going to go sit down if there isn't. <laughs> well, so I have a question because you have such a, a long history with the legislature. You know, um, and and I actually posed this to Sean Flugarty yesterday. He was in the wheeling meeting. But but I'm hearing that um, with the current leadership and and the kind of things that are happening right now as we speak, that there are legislators who want the best for WVU but don't trust them to use money wisely. Um, and, and I just wonder how do we get out of that conundrum? It's like catch twenty two. I do believe there is a serious management problem at WVU that is not present at most of these other institutions. So the problem that the legislature created by underfunding higher education in general, I think has been aggravated by poor management at WVU. So, and I'm not advocating for a change in administration, but what I'm trying to get at is on the one hand, there are people that want to um, totally change the purpose of it and, and are you know, labeling it with all these kind of extremist um, labels. And on the other hand, there are people that really want to help it, but don't trust giving them the money to, to get through this crisis. Um, and, and that's where I'm kind of hung up right now. Okay, um, I, I think you're right. No, no answer? No, I gave you the answer. I think you're right. <laughs> that there are people who uh, would want to help, but believe that the school is being mismanaged. And I concur that the school is being mismanaged. And that is part of the problem. It's not all of it. It doesn't get the legislature off the hook uh, because the problem is everywhere, but it's more acute uh, at WVU. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We have one more question. The number I hear about it around is 47 million. 45. 45, I think, is the last I heard. But it got worse since we were out here. <laughs> I mean, many of these are estimates. <laughs> Can you repeat the question, John? Uh, the question is, he, he started off by saying the number he has heard is 47 million. That is the deficit. And I said, I'd heard 45, but I also said that the, these, many of these figures we're hearing for all the schools are estimates. So it, he's not necessarily off the mark in using the term 47 million. But my question is, and I, this is what I hoped to hear this evening, but I, I don't think we're hearing it, is how did we get here? Uh, what, what, what was, how did, what, I mean, I don't know. I'm a scientist by training, and I'd like to look at numbers, but I, I, I have no idea what $45 million mean in the scheme of things at WVU. What's the total budget there? Uh, what budget. was it last year? All right, now, uh, let, let me tell him. Uh, the, the question is, how did we get where we are, and what does $45 million mean in terms of WVU's total budget? It is my understanding that WVU's total budget is somewhere around 270 million. Is, is that, that right? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. We are going uh, for their phones. Huh? People are going for their phones. I know they are. <laughs> we never, let me just say, sure. we didn't promise to come here with a deep understanding of facts and figures. What we came here tonight with uh, was to say, let's open our brains and come up with innovation solu innovative solutions. It's important to have a factual base. And those facts have, one of the, the ideas that was promoted in our first meeting on Tuesday night in Charleston was we need a serious audit, an independent audit, so that we know actually what's being spent, where it's being spent, uh, how it's being spent. So those are questions yet to be answered, sir. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know it was a lot more than that. Okay. Um, I don't know if, if someone, oh, Betty has a. I just have a follow-up question for John. Uh, yeah, it's my understanding that. Yeah. First of all, Betty, let me, the overall budget is 1.2 billion. So I was way off. 
So 45 million, if you want to look at it that way, is not a very high percentage. But I, I, I would argue that because we've already had about 15 years of cuts in higher education, and all of these institutions have been, have been contracting and contracting and contracting and contracting, uh, there's, there, there may not be a whole lot of room left. And I, I, would, I will say this, that uh, a part of where we came from in terms of WVU was when Gordon Gee became president, the school had, I think, 29,000 students in Morgantown and about 3,000 more in, in a couple of branch campuses, Potomac State and, and I think they'd already, Parkersburg. and Parkersburg, right. Although Parkersburg is not now part of WVU. It is totally divorced from it. It has the name WVU Parkersburg, but it has no connection to WVU. It has its own board, everything, yeah. So anyway, uh, um, the, and he believed that he could grow the enrollment to 40,000. Uh, I think he made a serious mistake. Starting out planning with a presumption that he could, he could grow the school to 40,000. And I do, I think that that is also part of why we are where we are. Uh, Betty? Uh, so it's my understanding that the governor has enough money in his contingency fund that he could um, he could invest forty five million without going back through the legislature since it since he has control over that money is that correct? Lord, I hope not, but it probably is. Back when I was on the finance committee, we would never let a governor have that kind of money in a contingency fund. We just wouldn't do it. Even governors we like, like like Bob Wise and Gaston Caperton, we just wouldn't do it. But apparently they're doing that now. Thank you. Yeah. I'll sit down now. Thank you. you know, there are some people who um, are quick to leap to conspiracy theories about what's going on. I have a, a theory of my own that it's not necessarily a conspiracy of uh, the in intent that there's somebody in a room that gathers with others and they have these strings that they can pull and they have, you know, but there is uh, attitudes that are similar and birds of a feather flock together and they have these similar attitudes about how things should be. And it seems to me that there is uh, an attitude that is very negative toward liberal arts. And um, the newspaper article on, um, I think it was Tuesday morning, the Charleston Gazette came out with an article about our first visioning session, Create West Virginia visioning session in this series. Uh, above it was a very long article quoting uh, the Senate finance chairman, Senator Tarr. And he made a very bold and broad statement that he hoped that what was happening at WVU would be a, a lesson and a model for other universities around the nation, that liberal arts education was the problem and the funding of liberal arts education. So that I've said all along that this is, seems to be part of an attitude to choke liberal arts. Um, well, there are lots of attitudes and opinions and arguments to be made, I suppose. But uh, I would like for arguments uh, and ideas to come forward to present to our Board of Governors in favor of liberal arts education and what liberal arts education is going to look like in going forward in the 21st century. We're almost a quarter of a century into this century already. And Corey Zinn has already described the the education that he had hoped to receive at WVU and finally carved out on his own. So um, tonight, here we are. Uh, I think everyone has spoken who is going to speak. We're certainly not going to, you know, I, I hope, sir, that you're not disappointed that I wasn't able to give you uh, a very good uh, description of why we are where we are. What I am saying is that Create West Virginia 
hopes to uh, provide a demand for innovative thinking here, not old think and not status quo thinking, but new thinking, new economy thinking. So um, thank you very much for coming here tonight. Uh, I'm not discouraged in spite of the fact that we're talking to an empty room. Um, I'm not discouraged. And it's not empty because you're here. Um, we intend to keep on with this. We intend, we'll have a, need, a meeting next week in Morgantown. Um, I would urge you to read up, uh, read all these articles and the facts and the figures that are presented uh, on the Create WV. Um, dot org website um, and then maybe join us next week listen in on the final meeting in this this series it's certainly not going to be the final meeting I can guarantee you that I wish that we had had time uh, we were this bomb was dropped on us uh, those of us who decided to do these this series of meetings we met last Sunday <laughs> and we said we're doing this come what may we're doing this so we're not stopping. There are many other places that we wish we could have gotten to in these days. We didn't have a chance to do it. We got a big Labor Day weekend uh, coming up here. But we intend to get around and we intend for the voices of the people to be heard. Thank you again for coming tonight. I, I have I will, a question. Unless someone else has something to say. I do have a question and, and just I'm curious if anybody has any, any answer to this question. Uh, which I've been kind of thinking about, and maybe it, uh, maybe you can see it kind of emerging from my thoughts about looking at community colleges and you know thinking more lean. Um, I feel like there's, you know, it's my intuition that there's a lot of redundancy in what WV is doing, and maybe that there's resources that different colleges could share. And I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts about. Um, more specifically on resources that don't need to be duplicated, but that the colleges could work together more, or that there's uh, resources that WVU could partner with even other universities, or um, does anybody, you know, on Zoom or in person have thoughts on that? Well, I would say uh, what we should do, Corey, is come up with a proposal, uh, look at things. I mean, oftentimes you come up with solutions, with solutions when you sit down and start thinking about it and putting ideas on paper, and then it all starts to coalesce in your brain and on paper about what might be done. Um, I know that we have amazing resources at WVU, uh, resources that were not called upon to uh, solve these problems. Instead, a lot of money was spent on outside uh, consultants. So, uh, yeah, I think, Corey, we need to do that. Yes, Bill. I've got a question. Could I ask you? Sure. Come on up. Uh, my name is Bill Kimmons, and I'm actually <laughs> Becky's assistant. And... Oh. Uh, and, and chauffeur, but and, and I've, I've been, been to every one of the meetings so, so far. And one of the things I think you said uh, that Gordon Gee was hoping to boost the registration from twenty nine thousand to forty thousand, and I'm wondering if that is why all that extra and new construction and building has gone into building all of those new apartments and everything out towards the North Campus. And if that is where the money went, because you were asking where the money went, you know, what, where did it go? And, and, and it, it sounds, sounds like it's so gone into construction and, and building the population of the school, which hasn't happened. And therefore they're trying to cut curriculum because there's no money. I don't know if that is That's an observation. It's an observation and a question if somebody can answer. Well, uh, an audit definitely needs to be made about where the money has gone and that, that can be answered. It's math. 
So um, tonight, I want to thank you all for making the effort to come here. Uh, I hope that it's been beneficial, and I hope that it's not the first, uh, the last time that you'll engage with Create West Virginia in thinking about what could be. I thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, and thank you, John Doyle, for coming. And uh, hey, Chris. and Chris, is that right? Yep, Tom. Tom, Tom. Tom is a reporter from the Martinsburg Journal. I look forward to seeing what you make of all this. Uh, and I hope that you'll join us uh, in Morgantown. Uh, it's central Mountaineer County uh, country. It's a, come on up there. If you're a WVU alum from central West Virginia, show up on Wednesday, uh, September 6th. And then there's a rally, I understand, right before the football game on sa game day, uh, Saturday the 10th, Saturday the 9th. I believe it is, yes, Saturday the 9th. Um, you can find information about that on the createwv.org site as well. Thank you very much for coming, and we'll see you next week in Morgantown. Thank you. Thank you.